Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our event here at America House in Munich with Franklin Fur on stage talking about the Joe Biden, um, the last politician book that just came out. A very special welcome to our audience on screen as well. This is the second event in a great lecture series put together by the Aspen Institute Germany and over 20 partners, the road to the election, uh, covering and providing insights in central issues during the US presidential election year. So welcome to you here. It's wonderful to see you. A lot of you coming back to our Munich Dialogue series and welcome to you uh, online. My name is Maike Zwingenberger and I'm with the America House here in Munich. Franklin Fur is a staff writer at the, at, at the Atlantic, I'm sorry, and former editor of the New Republic. I remember very well looking at his great book on soccer, how soccer explains the world. Combining the political and economic perspective, for example, explaining the late Silvio Berlusconi at the same time being president of Italy and the AC Milan. A great book, especially for Germans, I think, but I would not think um, that it really works for Americans. Soccer. Uh, Franklin Fur is really knowledgeable in this field. He covered the Women's Soccer World Cup for the Atlantic. But tonight we'll have a different topic, and I'm very much looking forward to Franklin Fur explaining Joe Biden as the last politician based on nearly 300 interviews. And although it is really important to look back at the first two years of President Biden in office, I think we will also take a glimpse into the future here tonight. Welcome Franklin Fur, and welcome Johannes Tim, our moderator. And for you Americans in the audience, there's also a Fur book on how football explains the world. So you might wanna look that up. And three quick thanks from my side before we start. One to Barte Grosserichter, our wonderful co-host tonight, president of the Yale Club of Germany and founder of the Munich Dialogues on Democracy series. Thanks to Stormi Annika Mildner and the Aspen Institute for including us to be part of the trip on the road to the election and to our team here at America House, program, technical staff, and everybody involved. Thank you and welcome. Thanks, Micah. Can he do it? I mean, how many times a day do people ask me that question, right? And I bet there's other people in the audience who get that too. So good evening and welcome also from the Yale Club of Germany. This is our first Munich Dialogues on Democracy event this year, and this is a super mega election year. I don't know if you know, there are over 70 elections around the world this year. This like doesn't happen very often. Um, and what we're especially watching, for example, in Germany are the regional elections in the fall in the east. Just there's a, there's a good chance that the far right AFD will win something, and what does that mean? Uh, the same goes for the European parliamentary elections, which are in June. That's on uh, a European level. There are countries where we see the far right coming up. What does that mean if they win um, how many seats? And we have five years of that kind of a parliament. Of course, the mother of them all is the November 5th US presidential election. It's almost certain to be a replay of the 2020 election, which means it will be President Joe Biden against former President Donald Trump. Tomorrow is Groundhog Day. Um, <laughs> but this means that with, uh, we've got everything from the future of NATO and Ukraine to uh, female reproductive health rights uh, and repro reproductive and health rights to the very tenets of democracy on the ballot. So we've got a blockbuster lineup this spring to address this, and I am so pleased to be able to introduce our first guest tonight and to be a part of the series, as Micah said, um, to kick it all off. What better place to start than with a journalist who wrote what has been called a landmark work of political reporting about the first two years of Joe Biden's presidency. He had unparalleled access to Biden's inner circle, and he really does give us a gripping portrait, not only of the decisions that were made, but of the man himself. And he writes, quote, in the story of Joe Biden, a pattern keeps reasserting itself. Just after he's dismissed as past his time, written off because of his daughtering detachment from the zeitgeist, he pulls off his greatest successes. I wonder if you still agree with that, and we'll see if it still works. I hope so. Um, but we can talk about that tonight. 
So, as you said, Franklin Fur is at the Atlantic, and um, he did write How Soccer Explains the World, which means, yes, that was him in the Netflix Beckham series that we all binged at Christmas. Um, and after his talk, we are very lucky to have a special moderator tonight. Dr. Johannes Tim is Senior Fellow and Deputy Head of the Americas Research Division at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs in Berlin. It's even longer in German. <laughs> He works on issues at the intersection of U.S. Uh, domestic politics and foreign policy and transatlantic issues. So he's the perfect person to have the conversation with us tonight. In his role at SVP, he's a frequent contributor to German and international media. He's the author of the book, The United States and Multilateral Treaties, A Policy Puzzle. And uh, he studied political science and international relations at the Freie Universität Berlin, the University of Washington in Seattle, and at, the Yale, at Yale University. So he is a member in good standing of our Yale Club here in Germany. Um, he will join Franklin on stage after the initial talk, and he will have a question and answer period. We will be using Slido again tonight. Um, it comes up on screen. So if you're here, you can just scan it, or you go to slido.com from home or online. You can go to slido.com and put in your questions, and the, the fabulous tech team here will make sure that they make it to the iPad up front. So without further ado, please join me in giving Franklin for a warm Munich willkommen. Uh, that's the only time David Beckham and Joe Biden have been mentioned in the same sentence. Um, let's see if he can bend it. That's the question that everybody's going to be asking about Joe Biden tonight. Um, Thank you for having me here. As a political journalist, it's really so important to step outside of your own country and go to another place. And um, coming to Europe and just being, being here this past week and talking to Europeans about this election has, has been, it's been very touching. It's been moving to see the level of concern that you all have for the fate of American democracy. And I know that it's a bit of a self-interested question as far as you're concerned, but I have to say that the sense of anxiety and urgency that I detect here is something that I find strangely missing from the American political context. I mean, it's one of the things that you hear all the time about what happens when you're confronting an authoritarian leader is, uh, you know, there's all these cliches about the frog and the boiling water. And I think it is true that Americans live through Donald Trump once. And there's almost this blase sense that a lot of people have that, you know, we can, we live through it once, we can live through it another time. And um, you, uh, the, the disenchantment that Joe Biden right now is experiencing with his left wing with black voters, with Latino voters, I mean, it's it's uh, it, with with other sectors of the the electorate. It's as almost if sometimes you wonder, did we not live through this movie once before? Um, but I want to just I, I'm going to start. I'm just going to give you a little bit of a sense of um, my own personal evolution on the subject of Joe Biden. My publisher came to me and asked me if I was interested in doing a book about the first 100 days of the Biden presidency just after the Democratic Convention in 2020. And I had to, I had to think about that, um, whether I really wanted to engage in that project. And it's not that there weren't very attractive themes that I was interested in exploring. I was really interested in watching uh, the new administration inherit the in broken institutions of government, watching them have to repair broken alliances, watching them rush into what was a once in a, in, in a century pandemic that had been very badly managed by the last administration. But the thing that gave me the most pause um, as I was mulling this project was the central character. And I, I, I kept thinking back to the first time that I, I met Joe Biden or I talked to Joe Biden on the phone, rather, when I was 24 years old. And five minutes into the conversation, I was like, my God, get this man off the phone. He's never gonna, he's never gonna stop talking. It's the same stories over and over again. And um, 
it, Joe Biden was part of the furniture of Washington. He'd been there. Um, he'd been in office in the Senate longer than I'd been alive. And, um, and, and there was this set of preconceived notions that people had about Joe Biden. And I had to, I think, interrogate some of my own preconceptions about him. Um, in part, you had this contrast during the Obama administration where you had uh, Barack Obama, who was, you know, who's, who's, who's intellectual, who speaks in poetry. And um, then you had Joe Biden. And I think Barack Obama, truthfully, had a lot of the same reaction to Joe Biden that I had as a 24-year-old reporter, that it, Barack Obama would make Joe Biden the butt of a lot of his jokes. In meetings, Barack Obama would sometimes roll his eyes at Joe Biden when he started to go into one of his monologues where he talked about his hometown of Scranton and the people that he knew there and started talking about the wisdom that his father had told him. And people in the room, the other aides, would kind of take it as fair game that they could make fun of, of Joe Biden too. And the person who was most aware of the fact that Joe Biden was getting made fun of was, of course, Joe Biden. And um, Joe Biden is somebody who um, has been part of the elite. He's part of the transatlantic elite, part of the Washington elite for a very long time. But he's always been self-conscious that um, he, he says he went to a state school. He didn't go to the Ivy League. He was, sorry, he's not a member of the Yale Club in full, paying, paying full dues. Um, he's somebody who, um, who speaks in a different sort of way, who has a different set of kind of cultural affinities. And, um, and, and that, that comes from a couple different places. Um, the first is, I think, as a kid, he had a stutter. He was, he was made fun of all the time when he was at school. Um, I think... It comes from the fact that when he ran for president in 1987, he was accused of plagiarizing a speech from the British labor leader, Neil Kinnock. And so this impression took hold that he was always mouthing somebody else's words, that there was something inauthentic about Joe Biden. And then the other thing, so, so, so th there is a very real chip on Joe Biden's shoulder. There's a real sense that he views himself as an outsider, somebody who is constantly underestimated by everybody else. And even now, even as president, uh, 80 years old, I would say a lot of those insecurities haven't dissipated. But the thing that I found fascinating as I went about studying him, so I, I sat there for the first 100 days, and I knew that first 100 days was a bit of a political cliche and that I would probably not have uh, enough material for my book. And I was hoping my publisher would you know, give me permission to keep going when I got to that mark. And I knew that ultimately the first two years of a presidency is when stuff actually gets done. But in the course of observing him up close, I came to um, a new appreciation of the skills that he brought to the table. And the title of my book is The Last Politician. And one of the reasons that I use that title is the last two presidents that we had, Barack Obama and Donald Trump, in very, very different ways were anti-politicians who campaigned against the system, who thought the system was broke, and they had a theory about how they could connect with these mass movements that existed outside the White House to send a shock to the system. And culturally, we have a very strong predilection, not just the United States, I think it's a universal thing, but it's, it's especially strong in the United States, to think of politicians as these phonies. Um, when I was a kid, one of the first jokes that I learned was about a guy who walks into a used brain shop and uh, he looks, and the most expensive of the used brains is sitting there, and it's labeled the brain of a politician. And he asks, why is this brain so expensive? And the, the seller says, well, because it's hardly ever used. And so there was a sense that, 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 and especially you see it with Joe Biden, where people have the sense that he, you know, he's trying so hard to be loved. He's trying so hard to get liked in these public appearances that 
he would say one thing in public and then do a different thing behind the back, that the stories that he tells that are just, that are corny, that they can't be real. But what, what I found was a lot of that is actually real. The difference between the public Joe Biden and the private Joe Biden is not that immense. Um, but, but the other thing is, is that uh, what he has as a politician is this, um, this learned innate sense about how to um, get people to do the things that he wants. I mean, that, that's what this whole skill of politics is, is that we live in this society, and it, this is why our faith in politics is broken down. We live in a society where people can't always get what they want. That, uh, that we, you know, the, the, you need p the practice of politics in order to resolve those differences, which is not the same thing, and this is a mistake I made, I assume that Joe Biden was naively fetishizing bipartisanship, that he thought of bipartisanship as an end to itself, but really in, 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 a, in a democratic society, you need politics in order to um, find ways to bridge those differences so that we can all coexist in, within the same borders, within the same world, but also in order to deliver things. And his theory was that we entered this crisis of democracy where people had started to lose faith in the legitimacy of the system. It was something that was happening internally in the United States, and it was something that was happening externally in the rest of the world. And it was his job to show that democracy could still work, and he needed to show that democracy could still work by showing that politics could still work as a way of delivering things for its citizens. Um, I'm... I, I have no idea how long I've taken, but I, I'm going to just uh, preempt a couple of your questions, and then we can open it up to, um, to questions and answers. Um, so you might ask, why is Joe Biden running for president again at, you know, as an 82-year-old man who will be finishing his second term at the age of 86? And on some level, I would struggle to understand that as well, and I think in the abstract, I personally would prefer not to have an 86-year-old president, but I think um, just putting myself in his shoes and trying to understand how he arrived at the decision that he arrived at, I think there, there are two things that could be said. The first is that we don't know what the alternative to Joe Biden is, that there could be, in 2016, we had an open primary where Hillary Clinton competed against Bernie Sanders. It was an epic battle between the left wing of the party and the center left wing of the party, and it left so many bad feelings, and it definitely contributed, that primary contributed to Trump's election because so many Sanders people came to dislike Hillary so much that they even voted for Donald Trump at the end of the day. And then you just don't, all of the alternatives to Joe Biden have, are, are essentially untested on a national stage. So they may be superior alternatives to Joe Biden, but we actually don't know that for a fact, and there's some risk associated with any of those other people. But the second thing is that um, as somebody who, so the interesting thing about Joe Biden is that people expected him to be a return to normal, that uh, he was thought of as this bland centrist who was gonna come in and he was just gonna, he was just gonna cool things down for a little bit while we bridged to the next Democrat and we recovered a little bit from the traumas of the Trump age. And he comes to office and he begins to propose some of the most ambitious pieces of social legislation in the history of the United States. Certainly, some of the most um, uh, expensive pieces of social legislation in the history of the country. And he sets about. Um, ending the longest war in American history, which two American presidents had wanted to end but were unable to end, and has a very ambitious foreign policy. Um, so he doesn't want to be a placeholder. He, that, that sense of, of always being underestimated is still with him, and I think it drives a lot of the way that he thinks about his own agenda. And I think it, thinks it, dri it probably drove, to some extent, his decision to run for re-election, because most of the world still does underestimate Joe Biden, and he's still trying to, in some sense, uh, 
prove them wrong. All right. I now uh, <laughs> think it's a good moment to transition to conversation. I look forward to um, getting your questions online. Thank you. Okay, can everyone hear me? <laughs> Is the microphone on? Yes? You're good. Okay. Thanks. That was a great introduction. Uh, already a lot of stuff to work with. Um, good. I'm going to pick it up right where you left it off. You, you mentioned it in your introduction. You said that uh, it's kind of a constant theme that Joe Biden is underestimated. Yes. And I very much agree. I mean, that already started during the primaries, right? Where yeah. nobody thought that he would eventually be the candidate of the Democratic Party. And it's a constant theme throughout his presidency. I think many Americans are not quite aware uh, of all his legislative accomplishments. That's one of the problems he has in this campaign. Uh, if the Americans aren't really aware, I don't think we can expect the German audience uh, to be aware. Maybe you can yeah. take us through some of his greatest accomplishments in those first two years that you described. Well, it's, quite uh, I mean, one of the strange this. things is that Donald Trump, every, every so often in his presidency, would talk about how it was going to be Infrastructure Week. And he would say, we're going to embark on trying to pass a massive bipartisan infrastructure bill. And Donald Trump never proposed that bill. And then Biden comes into office and he says, okay, Donald Trump was actually right. There is the basis for making a deal on infrastructure. And it becomes one of the centerpieces of his uh, presidential agenda. And he actually gets it done. But if you look at the polling, and I'm sorry to horrify all of you out there, but it's like people, the American people, actually attribute that infrastructure bill to Donald Trump, according to the polling. They, like, even though Biden was the guy who actually got it done, People in their heads have it in their minds that Trump was the, the effective guy and that Biden is the guy who's um, too old to be presiding over this world that is spinning out of control. But to talk about Biden's accomplishments, I, I want to step back just a little bit because I think I talked about his ambition. And one of the things that I find so interesting about him is how he's taken the, um, the, the state's role in the economy in a fundamentally different sort of direction that we know from Ronald Reagan through Barack Obama, there was a consensus that presided, people call it neoliberalism, but there was this deference to markets, this faith in free trade, the sense that st the st state didn't want to have too big a footprint. And, um, and Trump started to reverse that. He talked a big game about that. And then Biden comes in and in a much more, adult, mature, responsible source of way starts to actually implement that agenda. So unions were on decline for many generations and Biden is the first president to walk a picket line and has presided over a couple really big wins for American labor. And so union membership is on the up, their prestige is on the up. Um, he, we, we've spent a generation or two basically never challenging monopolies and he has uh, he's presiding over big cases against big tech and also they've rewritten the merger regulation so that it's going to be much more difficult moving into the future to implement a lot of these these big monopolizing mergers but most fundamentally is that there is a series of pieces of legislation I talked about infrastructure there's a bill that um, that jump starts the American semiconductor industry. And then of course there's the Inflation Reduction Act, which is one of the worst titles in legislative history that will jump start the transition to clean energy in the United States. And you take all of these things of a piece and it's really, the state has a substantively different role in managing the economy. The state is making these big bets on the future of the American economy. And they're saying, we can speed up the way in which America claims the commanding heights of the industries of the future. And it's just, it's, it's, it's actually something that's happening now. There's a lot of capital that was sitting on the sidelines that's jumping into the construction of massive plants. And the way that supply chains work now is once you start to build in a certain area, then it becomes imperative for other companies to move in and build next to those things. Unfortunately for Joe Biden, I think 
a lot of those benefits are not going to manifest themselves until five years from now, uh, 10 years from now in some cases. And, uh, and he's not dealing with a major sector of the economy. Manufacturing is really important, but it doesn't actually employ that huge a sector of the American workforce. So it's just not connecting in a visceral sort of way where it becomes the lived experience, to use a phrase of the moment, for most Americans. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to, to unpack there. I think it's a very important point that you made is that Biden has actually returned to some kind of industrial policy and active government intervention in the economy. Uh, before that, there was a consensus among both parties, or before Trump, actually, there was a consensus among both parties that government should get out of the way and the market and globalization would take care of things. And I think the fact that Trump was so successful in 2016 was uh, an indicator that people weren't happy with, with the state of affairs. But Trump basically talked a lot and he started trade wars, but other than that, he didn't do much in terms of active policy. Yeah. And like you said, Biden then actually followed through. But I think that's an important, an important uh, change in American policy generally. And I don't think we're gonna see any future president going back to the way it was before. Yeah, yeah. So that's a huge impact that Biden had. But I mean, it's also important to note that he just, uh, these two years, his first two years in office, the Congress was, this was one of the most productive eras of Congress. I mean, and, it passed. And it was divided, it was, it was a 50 50 Senate, so Kamala Harris close. needed to break the tie, tie, so he was pushing an agenda with very thin margins. So we had four major pieces of legislation, big legislations that were hard to pass. And if you, if you look at the money that was spent, as you mentioned, they were humongous. And so that, that's, I think, already a legacy that proves your point that he was underestimated. He was not this moderate, middle-of-the-road guy, but he was quite ambitious. Um, let's talk a little bit about foreign policy, because okay. that also takes up a big part in your book. Um, and let's start with Afghanistan, which you also mentioned in, uh, in your introduction. His big plan was to end the forever war in Afghanistan. And uh, of course, uh, we, we all know how that went, but uh, you spend a, a great deal of time explaining the behind the scenes of that in your book. What would you say was, was remarkable about that, and how would you assess that with, with some distance now in, in hindsight, the, the decision to withdraw from Afghanistan? So what I would tried to do here was try to... There was a lot of moralizing about the withdrawal from Afghanistan, which I probably agreed with uh, at the time. It, it just felt, felt terrible to abandon allies in the way that we did, and it felt... Uh, unnecessarily messy the way that we ended up exiting from the country. But I wanted to check my own impulses there, and I wanted to try to tell the story as people actually experienced the withdrawal from Afghanistan. So about a month or two after the disaster, I started to call people in the administration, and my goal was to just kind of serve as their confessor or their shrink or something, and so to get them to tell the stories. And I tried to do it from the perspective of the Situation Room, uh, from the perspective of the, the, the State Department. And then one of my, uh, one of, I mean, two of my favorite stories in the book, I told it from the perspective of Hillary Clinton because Hillary Clinton could see, uh, as soon as Biden made his decision to withdraw from Afghanistan, Hillary Clinton could see, had this special connection to the women of Afghanistan. When she was first lady, um, she persuaded her husband not to recognize the Taliban government. And when she was uh, a senator and secretary of state, she would go visit Kabul. She would meet women who were entering into civil service. And very quietly and without anybody knowing, Hillary Clinton would fund fellowships for some of these women. She'd begun to produce documentaries about some of these women. So she hears that the decision is about to get made or she hears the decision has been made, and she starts calling around. And a lot of her protégés have very powerful jobs, including Jake Sullivan, who is the national security advisor. And she asks very pointed questions of them. Who is managing the process that will get visas to these women? And in fact, somebody in the government, uh, I report in the book, somebody in the government 
leaked her a list of 125 names of women that they considered to be especially vulnerable. And Hillary Clinton, with a flair for a little bit of drama, started to refer to this as the kill list. And so she would call up these, these officials and say, I know about the kill list. What are you doing about it? Who's in charge of getting these women out? And she just kept applying pressure on them. And she came to the conclusion that they wanted to get out of Afghanistan so badly that they weren't fully thinking through the humanitarian part of the decision. And so she began to set up her own network of safe houses where they got houses that had been used for battered women in, in Kabul and uh, arranged to have them be used as meeting points if something should have happened uh, in the government and uh, then arranged eventually as things started to get bad, arranged for private security to come and take those women from the safe houses into the airport. Very harrowing. Women, uh, th they ended up calling them the white scarves because when she called people in the Pentagon, they said, we need some mechanism for identifying these women. And they decided that they would wear, they'd have a white scarf either on their head or attached to their luggage or something that would make them identifiable, which of course wasn't quite enough in the chaos of, uh, the evacuation. Anyways, long story short, she ended up getting a thousand women into Albania of all places because she had a relationship there and then arranged, she called up Justin Trudeau and was acting kind of as a shadow secretary of state and arranged for the C Canadians to ultimately relocate uh, those women. And I use that as a counterpoint because it was possible to see what was about to happen in Afghanistan, they weren't. There, it wasn't. People weren't blind to the possibility that things could go wrong. But I also tried to tell it from the perspective of Joe Biden, who really he was fighting the last war, and he really wanted to not get outmaneuvered by the military, who had out, he thought had outmaneuvered Obama and prevented him from actually doing the withdrawal, and. Uh, Biden, as soon as he started to see the images of chaos in Afghanistan, started to swing in the other direction. And he, st he said, every C-17 that's going to leave Hamid Karzai International Airport needs to be filled to the max in order to uh, get as many people out. They weren't vetting the people who were leaving Afghanistan. They were waiting to vet them when they got to Qatar. And, uh, and, and, and Biden had to live with his decision and visit the, the, the caskets as they came home to Dover Air Force Base and to meet with the families who were so hostile to him. And one of the most incredible things that I think I learned about Joe Biden in the course of doing this is I always thought of him as kind of a barometer that when the political winds started to shift, he would change his position. But he never regretted his decision to withdraw. He never backed away from it. He never fired anybody over that decision. He, you know, he deflected at a couple moments, but for the most part, he owned that decision. And his, his, his thinking was, I made the uncomfortable decision that nobody wanted to make, and I'm going to wait for history to judge me rather than to get pushed around by what New York Times columnists say or some angry pundits on television. Right, and I mean, this was, of course, an incredibly difficult decision, and I think everybody has their own ideas about whether it was the right decision or not. I think what's very clear is that they did underestimate the, the advance of the Taliban, how fast it would be, and they kind of botched the evacuation, but your account is sort of interesting that it tells the inside story of how, once they realized that, they tried to sort of mitigate the, the problems that they had caused by getting as many people out as possible and helping as many yeah. people. But I think from a political, partisan politics point of view, it's also an interesting moment. I, I heard an analyst say um, the day that Kabul fell was the first time his job approval rating plunged between 50, uh, be below 50% and it hasn't recovered since. Yeah. What's your assessment of that? Do you agree that that's a major factor of how he's, he's being per perceived to this day, or do you think it's, it's more other factors that, that uh, determine his perception? Yeah, I do. When he came into office, um, 
he rode this wave where everybody thought, my God, it's so refreshing to have competent government because they've been very effective in rolling out the vaccine. They got legislation passed relatively efficiently with little drama. But I think it relates, as I've thought about this over time, I think it relates to the age question that so much of the world is on fire right now. And uh, you, look at, you look at inflation, which is something that just the nature of inflation is that it is a spiral. It's something that cannot be controlled by an executive. Only central banks can really deliver the medicine. Um, you look at something like the war in U Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Like, why did this happen? You look at something like the chaos at the southern border. They're very good explanations for why these things happened based on the structure of the world. And did Putin really invade because he thought that Joe Biden was weak or did he have this dream that he was ready to implement? Because you, know, there, there, you can come up with all sorts of alternative explanations, but in the public's mind, I think they look at Biden and they look at kind of the, a little bit of the removed figure that he cuts in the world where he's not on television all the time. And when he is on television, he seems like a very old guy. And they look at that and they say, this guy can't possibly be in control. And what we really need is somebody who is incredibly strong to step in and restore order to this chaotic world. Right. I'm looking at the time and it's slipping away. Sorry. Um, that's no, no, that's fault. fine. I'm, it's, uh, it's, it's, <laughs> I'm the moderator. <laughs> that's, that's all right. But um, I, this seems to be like a good segue to, to kind of look at the, the year ahead and, or the time between now and the election. Um, and you mentioned uh, inflation, which up till now has been a huge problem for him and his popularity, right? Yes. And, and in the US media, they, they coined a new term for that. They, uh, they talk about the vibe session because many voters in the US actually thought they were in recession when it wasn't true. Um, there are people who research this stuff and they say, well, uh, for, for inflation to go down takes time, but then for people to realize that inflation has gone down takes even more time. What's your best guess is, so inflation has gone down. The economy is actually pretty strong. Um, we have almost full employment. Uh, we have growth. We have uh, falling inequality. Um, do you think between now and November, people are going to realize that? Or this is a question I'm, I'm asking myself, actually. Or is the media environment in the US at, uh, at the moment so polarized that kind of no matter what happens in the real world, people are not going to uh, adjust their, yeah. their perception? Um, all right. So there are the two different problems, and they're both they're both real big obstacles to Joe Biden's re-election. The first, I do think that the vibe session is true. The economy is fundamentally strong. But when you go to the store, you're still ticked off that you're paying two bucks more for a gallon of milk than you did a couple years ago. Your credit card interest rate is still incredibly high because of the medicine that was used to quash inflation. It's still really expensive to buy a house. So there are objective reasons why people are still upset over inflation as a fact of life. Um, and there is a real media problem that he has. And I think about it a lot of the times in the context of how they write about age and how they think process the question of age. And you hear it as a question of mental acuity quite often. And again, something you can understand why people would objectively be concerned about and want to talk about. Um, you know, but there is this way in which the question of Joe Biden's mental acuity gets placed on a spectrum with the questions about Donald Trump's mental acuity. And I got to say, like forgetting somebody's name or getting lost in a story occasionally is not the same thing as being an absolute lunatic. Right. <laughs> I'm going to take a, a few questions from, from Slido now. And there are, there's sort of a cluster of uh, questions about his running mate. And uh, the, the first one um, uh, is just on a very basic level. How important will be Biden's running mate, given his age, and who will it be? And maybe we can take two together. Um, the other one is, why did Joe Biden not prepare a strong number two candidate and step down after his first term? You kind of hinted at that in your introduction already. but maybe I, I, think, I think Joe Biden 
he he was never enamored. I mean, I I didn't report this myself, but according to other people's reporting, he was never enamored with Kamala Harris as his pick, and he ended up backing into her. And there was animosity between the two of them, but she did have, uh, you know, when, when she was picked as vice president, there weren't a lot of people who were saying, oh, that's a terribly weak pick for a possible successor. She seemed like a really plausible successor at the time. So first of all, he's not dropping her. Um, and just to back into this a little bit, Joe Biden was vice president. Um, the vice presidency is, uh, is the basis for a comedic show on HBO, Veep with Julia Louis-Dreyfus, because it's a funny job. It's like you have, you have all this, you, you, you seem like you're the second most powerful person in the country, and you actually have no power, and there are lots of jokes that get told about this in Washington all the time. But the harder, one thing harder than being the vice president is being a former vice president's vice president, because Joe Biden brings all of the baggage that he felt like he had from the Obama administration to bear on his relationship with Kamala Harris. So there are ways in which he treats her with a formal respect that he felt like he never got from Barack Obama. He'll refer to her as, so Barack Obama would call Joe Biden my vice president. And Joe Biden always like, you know, he's talking about me, my vice, it's like my poodle, my, and, um, and so he always calls Kamala Harris the vice president. And he's very, uh, diligent about saying, you got to run this by the vice president in her office. But Barack Obama needed Kamala Harris. Uh, sorry, Barack Obama needed Joe Biden. Joe Biden doesn't especially feel like he needs Kamala Harris. And that puts her in a very tough position where she's in every meeting. But it's been hard for her to figure out what her space is and what her issues are. And both Joe Biden and, and Kamala Harris have insecurities that are very similar to one another. Joe Biden's afraid of looking stupid. Kamala Harris is afraid of making mistakes because she's afraid that she'll get creamed for because she's the first black woman. And she's afraid that when she makes a mistake, it's going to affect every other black woman who comes after her. And that maybe, it, and so she ends up talking in a way where she, does, she doesn't feel like she's directly answering questions because you know, the expression driving defensively. She's kind of always driving defensively, too afraid of making a mistake. She overprepares in some sort of the same ways that Joe Biden overprepares. But Joe Biden also, I think, prides himself on being loyal. And he doesn't really fire anybody. And he's not going to fire her. And I think it would be a problem in terms of perception if he first appointed a, a woman of color to the job and then and drops her at the first moment, yeah. right? And that kind of sex into another difficult topic, um, which is that Joe Biden right now has a problem with um, some part of his base because of his Middle East policy, right? So we have another crisis, the war in Gaza, a hor horrific war, another crisis that Joe Biden didn't pick that just sort of happened while he was in office and that he has to deal with now. Um, and he's made a very conscious choice of how he wants to deal with, with the crisis, but uh, um, that hurts him both with uh, people of color, with the people who are attached to the Black Lives Matter movement, um, and of course with people of Palestinian or Arab descent who happen to live in many uh, swing states. Maybe you can talk about that a little and, bit. And hurts him potentially with, as you say at the beginning, younger voters who are, you know, to the left and who were already disillusioned with Joe Biden. I think the war is an expression is an expression of a continued disillusionment that they have with Joe Biden, which is. In some ways, a strange thing because Joe Biden forgave massive amounts of student debt, which everybody said was the issue that young people cared about most. But I think that, um, and, 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 and he's also been just an incredibly progressive candidate in all these other ways that we've just described, but he hasn't found a way to speak to, uh, to, to young people, to the base of his party, to make them feel any sort of real love for them and then this comes along and it exacerbates a problem that he has and it's a real problem because even if Gavin Newsom or Gretchen Whitmer were the candidate, this election would likely come down to 
a handful of swing states that are going to be decided on the basis of 10, 15, 20,000 votes. And so we have the state of Michigan, which happens to be home to a very sizable Arab American population and is a, and is a deeply purple state it really does feel like there's a live possibility that the war could could decisively hurt Biden. Mm -hmm. um, looking through my questions here, some people are already looking very far ahead. There's one <laughs> question, I don't know if, if you want to answer that, but if Biden wins a second term, how would you predict that will influence the direction of both the Democratic and Republican Party and the 2026-2028 elections? Boy. <laughs> um, all right. Well, I, I, I can't think that. My mind breaks yeah. to think that far ahead. <laughs> I'm, we're, we're dealing, uh, we have enough our plate on our plate until November. We can't think that far ahead. But no, I mean, just, to, to, uh, just to think about a second term ever so briefly, which is that it, it's, it's likely that there will be some form of divided government. So there's never going to be a period like the first two years that I wrote about where he has a chance to really impose a legislative agenda on the country. I think he, he really enjoys foreign policy probably as much or if not more than domestic policy. Talking to foreign leaders is his happy place. Uh, when they come up with his schedule, it's like you can allocate 15 minutes or half an hour for a phone call, but you know it's going to go on for 90 minutes, maybe two hours, and it's just going to blow up his day because it's what he... And, and then afterwards, he loves getting his aides in and doing a post-mortem of the call and like talking about how smart he was in the call, but also um, just like downloading because it's just so exciting to him. And I think it's one of the reasons why he loves it. And I have to say, it's the place where his experience matters the most because you look at something like China or you look at something like Iran and he's threading a needle. He's pushing hard to try to deter and contain and to redirect American foreign policy, but he's also trying to avoid escalation and war. And it really helps to be somebody who has a deep self-confidence and a good feel for the leaders and the issues. And I think there's a chance that a less experienced leader, things could either go disastrously off the rails one way or the other. Yeah, I mean, just taking the premise of the question, I'm not making any predictions here, but if Biden gets reelected in November, I think one interesting question will be, uh, will the Republican Party take any lessons from having lost the, the because fourth they, they, election they, they in take, a row? Yeah. <laughs> they but take so many election, uh, lessons from every other they, loss that they, they suffered. They haven't so far, but at some point, I mean, they, they want to start winning again, so you would, you would presume. But uh, you, we don't know whether whether he's actually going to be reelected. So uh, it's uh, anybody's guess. Um, how would you? This is, uh, this is a variation of a question that's on here. But how would you judge so far uh, Biden's record against uh, Obama's record? Um, so you you have to grade on a curve or say that they're not apples and oranges, they're apples and oranges, uh, that I think uh, Obama inherited a set of crises. He inherited a financial crisis. Um, uh, that was the big, the big crisis, a very big crisis. And he had one major domestic, real domestic accomplishment, which was Obamacare, mm -hmm. um, which is totally important and has been expanded under the Biden administration, um, you'd have to say his big foreign policy initiative when he went to Cairo and gave his Cairo speech and was going to try to take the Arab Spring and, you know, it propel an Arab Spring towards democracy. Well, that didn't, that didn't really work out that well. Um, I think there, there's a lot of other good things that Barack Obama did when he was president. Um, uh, it, but I think you would also say, all right, Joe Biden's legislative accomplishments are probably more immense than than Obama's. I mean, if you consider um, if you consider climate change the existential question and American leadership on climate change to be an extremely important um, uh, mechanism for for getting the rest of the world to do things. Uh, 
you know, can I just tell a story, which is, so with, with the climate change legislation, everything depended on um, getting the 50th senator to come aboard. And for a while, there were two senators who were jockeying for that role. There was Kristen Sinema from Arizona, and there was Joe Manchin uh, from West Virginia, both of them relatively conservative Democrats. Manchin comes from a coal state that has a very strong interest in preserving a fossil fuel industry. And so he was negotiating with the two of these guys, and they both wanted things that were at odds with one another. And um, when it came to Manchin, they were, he was so close to getting Manchin to sign up for $2.1 trillion in, in social spending that would have been the most social spending since the 1960s by a large margin. It would have been some of the biggest entitlements ever uh, cr created since Medicare and Medicaid. And um, Joe Biden really, really loves his real estate. I mean, it's one of the things that I think is really kind of both charming and reflective about him. He has this house in Delaware that he bought. He's a big, he was a big do-it-yourself guy and was there in the muck, uh, you know, his, knee, his knees, knees in mud, pounding in drywall, and he's built this house that is like his pride and joy, and, um, and his, he brings Joe Manchin to come. It's the first time he's used the, that house as a political set, and he gives Joe Manchin a two-hour tour of the place and goes over these final details with Joe Manchin, and... He's pushing him hard on various things. And at the end of the conversation, they shake hands, and Joe Manchin tells him, I want to I wanna get this done for you, Mr. President. And Joe Biden is like, done and dusted. If a guy comes into my house and shakes my hand, words as good as his bond, solid as oak, we're going to get this done. And Manchin didn't really want to do, he just didn't believe in social spending. And so you get to December, and the negotiations get... It said Biden's negotiating with Manchin. Manchin felt very singled out. And he freaks out about it and says, I'm killing the legislation because of this. And Biden, Biden's people didn't really believe him. And then half an hour before Manchin goes on a TV show, his chief of staff leaves a message saying, Biden's about, uh, Manchin's about to pull his support for this bill. And Biden gives him a call and in desperation, He's trying to reach Manchin. Manchin won't pick up the phone. He tells him, Joe, how could you do this to me right before Christmas? You're killing my presidency. And it looked for a long time like Biden's presidency was going to be dead because he'd botched his personal negotiation with Joe Manchin. And then Biden makes this decision that he's going to step out of the negotiations a little bit, even though it's very painful for him because he loves negotiating with other senators so, so much. Um, his, his chief of staff, Ron Klain, said, you're not the prime minister, Mr. President. Um, and then Manchin gets, you know, gets slowly brought back to the table. They take out some of the regulations, so it's just all carrots and no sticks as it relates to uh, clean energy. And 10 people in Washington understood that they were about to pass this really important piece of legislation. And, and it happens. And, and it definitely falls into the category of the things that you're describing, which is it's a, it's a transformational bill. The transition to green energy in America is happening much faster than I think people anticipated in no small measure because when they were negotiating with Joe Manchin, Manchin didn't realize that there was no upper limit on the amount of tax credits that they can give to clean energy companies because he was relying on some government accountant's sense of how much the government would spend. And so he thought we were going to spend $369 billion on uh, subsidies and tax credits, but it's going to be well over a trillion dollars that we end up spending. I was actually going to ask you about your treat treatment of, of, of Manchin because you're your account of Biden is very sympathetic, but I also felt like your account of Joe Manchin was quite sympathetic. I mean, there's a take on Joe Manchin where it's basically he's just in the pocket of, of energy interests and he's been personally benefiting from opposing a lot of the previous climate bills and so on. Uh, how come you're so nice to him? Is it that well, in the end he pulled through and yeah, actually gave it's, us? It's, I, uh, I think in the end, 
it's like he's delivered and he had no reason to deliver at that stage. It, he could have, if he wanted to go off and become a lobbyist and, uh, uh, and, and he could have he could have done that, but he ended up helping uh, pass this thing that's going to make the transition away from the energy that his state depends on. Yeah. And he is also all the things that you described as well. But you know, it's 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 actually it's an interesting little case study. I, I felt like. Um, I felt like in that instance, I had to just, I had to be true to the negotiations, and also if I had just described him as being um, a corrupt, self-interested guy, then I would have actually missed the big story, which is that he got this deal done. Mm -hmm. There was one question, and maybe we can make it a little broader than the question. The question is: uh, There's been some criticism lately from the the people surrounding Obama that. Uh, uh, Joe Biden isn't taking the campaign seriously enough or isn't starting to campaign uh, already for, for the election and he should really get going on that. Uh, uh, I don't know if you want to speak to that, but you can also open up a little bit and, and, and talk about your view of, of sort of the eight months ahead that uh, what do you think is important? Uh, how, how optimistic are you that, uh, that Biden is going to get a good campaign running? Um, well, I think maybe... I think when Bartley quoted my book about the idea that he'd been underestimated before, and that's something that he really believes. Like, I've been underestimated before, therefore, and I've, I've proved everybody wrong in the past, therefore, that will happen again. And I think it's a very circular line of logic. Mm -hmm. And also, neglects the fact that he's failed a lot in his life. He's also overestimated himself quite frequently. Um, he thought that he would be president in 1988 and in 2008, and that didn't. He ran terrible campaigns in those instances. And uh, being a politician, there's two parts to the job. There's the governing part where I give him high marks, and then there's the communicating and campaigning part um, where I think he gets he gets much lower marks. In the 22 midterm elections, he did have a better sense of the electorate than the pundits and a lot of uh, the Obama people like to talk about the bedwetters, the people who panic unnecessarily. And so people were, were being bedwetters in 2022 about crime and inflation. And they were saying, you've got to speak directly to these issues. And Biden's analysis was, I have to make this an issue, an election about democracy because I don't want to be speaking about high crime and high inflation because there's no way that I can win. It has to be a referendum on Donald Trump, not a referendum on me. And he was successful, and the Democrats managed to avoid all of the historical patterns that had led them to be, that every incumbent party falls, uh, uh, falls subject to in midterm elections where they lose power, and Democrats managed to maintain control of the Senate. And so his campaign this time is a big bet that they can repeat the strategy from 2022, which is it's not a referendum on Biden, it's a referendum on Trump. In some sense, Biden's already lost the referendum on Biden based on where his poll numbers are. And Trump has lost the referendum on Trump many times before. So, or before, let's, let's, let's subject him to that same thing. But um, it's gonna be a real, the real interesting question is, Biden can't run the same campaign that he ran in 2020. He can't sit in his basement and do Zooms. Um, he's going to have to get out there and do rallies. He's going to have to connect with the base of his party who feels disconnected from him. And that's going to require a lot of energy. And does he... I, I could tell you he's got the mental acuity to be president right now, but I don't know if he's got the physical reserves of energy to be able to campaign to be president again. 
And you know, one, one of the things of sitting in Europe that's kind of unfair is that we don't get to vote. I mean, unless there are some Americans here in the audience, but the, the normal German doesn't get to vote in the American election, but yet we are very much affected by it. And you mentioned in your introduction that it's interesting to get out here and travel and that you're uh, astonished by the amount of concern for uh, Amer American democracy that you've heard on your trip here in Europe. Um, maybe you can talk about a little bit what the effects uh, would be if Trump does get elected, and I should say the Atlantic, where Franklin works, they just have a big issue out, if you haven't seen it, in January or February issue is what if Trump gets elected to a second term. The whole issue of, of the magazine is only about that, different aspects of a, of a second Trump turn, and I can highly recommend it, but maybe you can speak a little bit about uh, what worries you or, or what your assessment is both in the U.S. context, in the context especially maybe American democracy, American institutions, and maybe also a little bit for the rest of the world. Uh, there's the, the thing that I, I always detest most about Trump and that I worry about most is that he finds an effective way of speaking to the worst parts of ourselves, that he's able to, he's somebody who has the capacity for unleashing things, unleashing thoughts, unleashing ideas that may exist in the subconscious or that have been pushed into the arena of taboo. And then because he then goes out and says these things, it then makes it accessible, uh, acceptable for the rest of the world to say those sorts of things. And um, just as I register the impact of the first Trump term, it's the ways in which America didn't return to some sort of Edenic pre-Trump state after Trump, that there was this uh, toxic contrail that followed him out of the White House. And, uh, and people in, in my country have just become coarser, ruder, more xenophobic, and that's a lasting cultural impact. What will happen after four more years of that? Um, I really worry about what will happen to the actual infrastructure of government in the United States. So one of the things that Trump, so Paul Krugman, the New York Times columnist, has a phrase that he used to describe the first Trump term, where he called it, malevolence tempered by incompetence. So they had a lot of bad ideas the first time around, and they weren't great at executing their worst ideas, thank God. But this time around, because Trump's first term was an accident. Trump didn't believe he would be elected president. The people around Trump didn't believe they were going to be elected president, so they never prepared, and that's why he was willing to let in all these experienced uh, Republicans into his cabinet. This time around, the people, the, the right wing knows that a Trump presidency is possible. They've been preparing for a Trump presidency. Trump thought that the deep state was a very big obstacle to his, him getting things done. Well, the libertarians and the, the, ultra, the ultra right hates hates the deep state because they hate the entirety of the state. They would like the state to, to disappear. Um, and so they have this plan that they tried to very ham-fistedly implement in the dying days of the Trump presidency, which was to rewrite the personnel regulations so that the president could basically fire not just political appointees, but the civil servants. The, the technocrats, the, the experts who, who don't get appointed by, by a president. And they weren't able to really pull that off in the last, but now they have plans, they have legal thinking. They're going to try to implement this plan, which means that you could have mass purge of, of the, the civil service. So you could go into places like uh, the CIA or the FBI or, uh, or the Justice Department or wherever, you could fire the people who, are, um, who just exist because they serve the nation 
and replace them with loyalists and hacks who serve the leader. And um, you, could, you could see the ways in which that would devolve into the punishment of enemies, into corruption, the ways in which it would be very hard for the government to quickly recover from the trauma of losing a lot of its best minds and having them be replaced with, um, with loyalists. Yeah, well, with that too. Yeah. And the, the international side? Is so, um, I mean, the, the, the thing about Donald Trump always is his unpredictability. I was just having a conversation on the way here where, uh, where somebody was telling me that they, they thought that Trump would never, uh, would never launch a nuclear war. And I tend to agree. Like, I think that, that Trump would probably not do that. It, 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 but the thing about Trump is, like, you, could you be, would you bet your life savings on something like that? I, I pro you know, I'd, I'd come close to, but I couldn't fully do that. And I just don't know, uh, kind of, how, how has he changed as a foreign policy leader having already uh, killed Soleimani, having done, you know, he's engaged in things where he's passed certain thresholds, where he's, he's commanded the government to use lethal threat against enemies of the United States. And um, so where does that go? I think, obviously, uh, his hatred for NATO, his, his, his dislike for certain parts of the Europe, the transatlantic alliance is, is deeply felt. And it's one of these things that probably just gets worse with time with him because he knows how to hate. He's really good at hating. And his, his hatred tends to just to, to, to ooze and expand over time. Um, he's really sincerely committed about um, his position on Putin in the war in Ukraine. Um, and he's taking a lot of people with him, right? I mean, the Republicans were very supportive uh, 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 on the war on, in, on supporting Ukraine in the war against Russia. Uh, in the beginning, uh, two-thirds to three-fourths of Republicans in Congress were in favor of aiding Ukraine, and now we're down to maybe half. It's hard to tell, and that's pretty much the influence of, of Donald Trump. So uh, a lot of people in the U.S. think that he's going to have a lot of pushback when he does crazy things like he did in his first term, and I'm not so sure that that's going to be the case. I mean, it depends on, on the majorities in Congress, but it also looks like uh, the Republicans are going to at least have the majority in the Senate. Um, well, that, that, is, that is, in effect, the biggest change, which is that when Trump came to power, he wasn't sure what he could get away with as it related to his own party. Um, his own party wasn't sure what its relationship to Donald Trump would be. But over time, he's consolidated his control over the Republican Party such that it's close to absolute at this, mo at this moment in time. So when we see this happening this week where the Democrats and Republicans have negotiated a deal about the southern border that would change some of our asylum policies, that would, that would have a meaningful effect on this thing that Republicans say is their big issue. And then Trump makes it known that he doesn't want this solution to get passed because he doesn't want Biden to actually make progress and have an accomplishment on this area. And, you know, he prevails. Our time is running out. Uh, I think I'm going to ask one more question, which perhaps is the meanest of all I've asked. You're going to ask me, uh, can I, I'm not going to guess. No, no, I, no. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to predict it could, the it election. Because it could be even meaner than the one that you're thinking about asking no, me. Um, what would your recommendation be to uh, German and European governments to prepare for a second Trump term? What should they do uh, in case he does get elected in November and does all the terrible things that we've been talking about? Um, you should build an enormous bunker. No. Um, <laughs> uh, what I think you should... You know, the... the the thing is, is that he, I think he, people have tried to man, there's no, what's the alternative that you have to, tr except but to try to manage him, right? It's like you, it's what's been tried before. He has, um, he has pretty big uh, psychic vulnerabilities that are there to be exploited. There, uh, you know, I, I thought that um, 
the way in which uh, Stoltenberg was able to develop a relationship with Trump that able that protected NATO. I mean, it's probably debasing and humiliating for him to have to go through that kind of charade, but it was pretty effective. I mean, that's pretty much the, the approach the German Foreign Office is, is trying out at the moment. I'm not quite convinced if, if that's the right way, but the Japanese thought they did pretty well. Shinzo Abe thought he had a pretty good relationship with Trump. The interesting thing is, and this brings us back to Joe Biden, uh, it is rumored that Angela Merkel was actually going to stop after three terms in office. And when Trump was elected, she said, you know, I can't leave that to anybody else. I've got to go one more time. <laughs> and that reminds me of the way Joe Biden thinks. Maybe Joe Biden would have uh, not run for a second term if the, if the world hadn't been in a state it, that it's it would been. Have been. It would have been definitely more complicated for him to make that decision. I think Donald Trump provided him with a sense of clarity about what his mission was. Maybe the world doesn't agree, have that sort of clarity around that sense of mission for Joe Biden, but, but he does. Right. I think I'm going to end it here. Thank you very much for your attention. I thought it was a great conversation. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Franklin. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope to see you again. On. This is not in my prepared remarks, but to lead on a positive note, Please. there is a huge opportunity because all Americans overseas can vote. And only 25% in Germany did, and it's like 10% in Europe. So if you know any Americans, just saying. So thank you very much, Frank and Johannes. And before we go, I'd also like, again, to thank the team at America House, um, Dr. Zwingenberger and the fantastic team in the back and the pro uh, the program team. Most importantly, I would like to thank you um, because you come and you support us and for everybody who has donated, it's what makes this possible. And uh, if you have not yet joined our community, you can go to our website, dialoguesondemocracy.com. And if you put in your email address, then you just get mails to, uh, that keep you abreast of what our events are so that you can come or join us online. Our next event is February 22nd with a Yale professor, Ian Shapiro, to talk about angry populist politics and what we can do about it. Um, and tonight, Franklin has generously offered to hang out and sign books. So we do have a book table in the back. Um, and if you're interested, we do have some wine to sort of help everything <laughs> and water and beer. Um, so join us for a conversation in the back. And uh, thank you so much for coming. See you next time. <laughs>